This is the SEG 2023 Base Metal Webinar Series. It focuses on the critical importance of base metals. Each webinar is dedicated to inve investigating a specific commodity with regard to the latest regional and global market trends, exploration highlights, and developments from within the industry that are impacting the global economy. The third installment provides an open forum for discussing the significance of nickel exploration and the increasingly critical role that it plays during the energy transition. SEG would once again like to thank MapTech for their generous support as our Base Metal Webinar Series sponsor for 2023. I'm your moderator, Lauren Zeke. I'm a PhD candidate at the Colorado School of Mines and the outgoing chair of the SEG Students Committee. This is our webinar outline for today. We've finished the introduction, and then we'll have presentations by Simon Jowett, Rebecca Sprawl, and Mike Lesher, followed by a panel discussion and open Q&A session. Reminder that the main Q&A comes at the end of the webinar, but you're still welcome to put in questions into the Q&A tab during the lecture, if that's when you're thinking of them, and the, and the presenters can respond at any time. Okay, first up, Simon is currently the tenured director of the Ralph Roberts Center for Research in Economic Geology and the Arthur Brandt Chair of Exploration Geology at the University of Nevada, Reno in Nevada, USA. He has a BSc honors degree in geology from the University of Edinburgh, an MSc in mining geology from the Camborne School of Mines and a PhD from the University of Leicester, all in the UK. Simon spent eight years at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, initially as a three-year postdoc research fellow working with Anglo-American before moving to spend seven years as an assistant and then tenured associate professor of economic geology at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. His research focuses on the use of geochemistry to unravel geological processes in a variety of settings with direct application to understanding not only mineralizing systems, but also igneous petrology, mineral exploration, global tectonics, and the links between magmatism and metallogeny. He has published more than 110 scientific papers and peer-reviewed book chapters since 2010. He's currently the Vice President for Student Affairs for the Society of Economic Geologists and was awarded the SEG Waldmer Lindgren Award in 2014. And with that, I'm gonna let Simon take it away. Thank you for the introduction there, Lauren. Uh, let me see. Share my screen here uh, and put this in presentation mode. So yeah, I'm going to be talking uh, today uh, about the uh, essentially a bit of background and context on on the, uh, the global nickel sector, resources, reserves, and supply, and also future demand for uh, for the for the for the devil's metal, if you like. Um, so without further ado, I'll just get straight into it. Uh, we know that nickel, like a lot of metals and minerals, is fundamentally important to modern life and society. It's crucial for the production of stainless steel, specialty alloys, electroplating, uh, and it's especially important and increasingly important in lithium ion uh, battery production. That's one of the reasons that we're expecting global nickel demand to soar as the world transitions to this, to the low and zero carbon dioxide and, and carbon neutral energy and transport future, this thing known as the energy transition that's been talked about an awful lot. And this future needs a lot of batteries, needs a lot of lithium ion batteries potentially for things like electric vehicles, but also grid scale storage to allow uh, solar and wind generation uh, plants to essentially have a, a base load capacity. Why do we call it the devil's metal? Uh, Saxon miners in Germany found rituals cut for nickel or, or devil's copper that didn't produce then valuable metals, but instead uh, were eventually found to contain nickel, which, uh, which back then wasn't of much use, but certainly is of, of significant use these days. Uh, we know that uh, the world is moving towards the energy transition and the World Bank, the International Energy Agency and various other groups suggest that global carbon neutral energy generation and storage and, and transport demand for nickel by 2050 is going to nearly equate to an adding another 100% of current production to the 3.3 million tons or so of what we already produce right now. In other words, in the, by 2050, we need to double the amount of nickel we, we, we mine in theory. And that means that understanding the, the current nickel market and no nickel resources and reserves, as in where we actually get nickel from right now, where we might get nickel from in the future is going to be incredibly crucial in order for us to ensure that uh, the, the, we have the nickel resources and reserves we need to enable the energy transition. And this includes, I'm not talking on this uh, much today, but certainly 
the environmental, social, governmental, governance challenges that the, the entire minerals industry are facing is certainly uh, going to impact the uh, nickel uh, production and the conversion of resources to reserves to production into the future. It's a key challenge for the entire minerals industry, and it's certainly a key challenge for the for the nickel sector. And this challenge, this, the, tra the energy transition we're talking about here, it's being driven by climate change mitigation, but also, and perhaps more, by consumer and investment spending and demand. People want things like Teslas, they want electric vehicles, they want green energy, and so on. But it's also important to realise that modern life itself is mineral and metal intensive. So before we actually jump into detail with nickel, we're just going to have a look at a, a, some wider context on, on the metal and mineral demand or intensity of modern society. So just an example of this on the on the left here we have a, a 1980s unsmartphone a brick and uh, use these uh, a number of elements that you can see there highlighted and on the right we have the thing that you might be listening to me on or have in front of you uh, a, nine, a current you know standard uh, smartphone and the range of elements there so what we've done essentially in 30 or 40 years is double the amount of elements we typically use in modern technology we might have dropped a couple like beryllium and lead, but we've added a whole load to give us the essentially the the, the things we consider normal in smart technology, including uh, a, a, we already use nickel, but certainly we use more nickel in, in modern technologies than we have before. And this just uh, kind of demonstrates that. So what we've got here is we've got a range of elements and a range of metals and minerals, uh, a lot of which are used in battery technologies like lithium and so on. Uh, what, all of this is the data here have essentially been normalized to production in 1956. In other words, if we mined exactly the same right now today as we did in the 1950s, you'd see that everything would lie along this dashed line here along the, the one value. What you see with the exception of arsenic, uh, we uh, we actually mine significant amounts of all of these of all of these metals and minerals and, and elements than we did in the 1950s, uh, and this just shows that you know this is this is just a, a function of uh, the metal and mineral intensity of modern life as well as increasing population. And you can see at the top there the, the amount of more nickel that we come that we mine uh, now compared to 1956. But it's not just the fact that kind of will population has increases if we normalize this to a per capita basis as if we normalize this to, to essentially a, a global population or four global population increases, we get this. And in essence, we still see that, we, you know, for the vast majority of metals, especially those metals we consider important for uh, things like lithium ion batteries, we're still, you know, every human on this planet is using more mined metals and minerals than any other point in human history for the vast majority of commodities we see. And that's especially true for metals and uh, metals like nickel, which are seeing increasing amounts of demand as a result of the energy transition and that increasing demand we're already seeing the impact of. So that's the kind of background and context where modern society, modern standards of living are in metal and mineral intense. But the thing to think about is if we start to focus on nickel, we need to think about kind of key drivers and, and key supplies and, and resources of, of this metal that we're focusing on today. We need to think about bef before we get into current resources and reserves, so we should have a think about current drivers of demand. We know the energy transition is an important uh, part of this. And we know what's driving that energy transition. But what we need to think about now is what are the implications for the nickel sector and for nickel mining into the future? So this is uh, initial uses of, of mined nickel uh, right now, or maybe from a couple of years ago. This is data from the Nickel Institute. Vast majority of uses from stainless steel, some non-ferrous alloys and alloy steel plating. And this sector here you see is essentially lithium ion batteries plus some nickel metal hydride battery uses. But this sector is what's going to expand into the future. We're going to see the, the essentially the same levels of demand, maybe increasing demand for stainless steel for use in the hydrogen economy, potentially. But this sector here, this battery sector, is what's going to actually be driving nickel demand into the future. We're already seeing the effects of that over the last couple of years. So this is why uh, you might like or dislike Elon Musk, but he has a good turn of phrase. He's just a quote here, their cell, uh, Nick Tesla cell should be called nickel graphite because primarily the cathode is nickel and the anode side is graphite with silicon oxide. There's a little bit of lithium in there, but it's like the salt on the side. So this is just looking at essentially cathode compositions like NMC or NCA. And what you see is the cathode compositions in lithium ion batteries, certainly these compositions, are very, very dominated by nickel. 
So uh, this is an NMC811 battery. It's the cathode in this lithium ion battery is 80% nickel, 10% manganese, 10% uh, cobalt, hence 811. And this just these battery compositions are becoming more and more, more popular as they have better energy density and better performance than a range of other lithium ion batteries. And that's why we've seen a shift from uh, essentially nickel uh, cobalt dominated cathodes in lithium ion batteries to more nickel dominated compositions because they're, they're essentially better performance. And this has implications because this is currently what we're looking at in terms of battery uh, capacity, planned and developed battery manufacturing capacity in North America. You can see there's a, over 300 gigafactory type developments, these large battery producing facilities, like where there's one just outside Reno, we're up here in, the, in Nevada. But you can see that, that this is what the capacity is kind of in North America for uh, essentially battery uh, manufacturing, all lithium ion batteries, all of which are using quite a lot of nickel. If we look at a, a, a typical a gigafactory, a typical large manufacturing facility producing 35 gigawatt hours of NMC811, so this is nickel, manganese and cobalt in proportions of 8 to 1 to 1 in the cathode. If you do the calculations, it needs about 4,000 tons of lithium, over 3,000 tons of cobalt, over 26,000 tons of nickel and about 3,000 tons of manganese, as well as a lot of graphite. If we compare that to global nickel production in 2022, which the USGS estimates at 3.3 million tonnes, that means a single large or very large battery manufacturing facility requires about nearly 1% of global nickel production. That assumes they're producing these NMC811 batteries and that all of these battery factories are going to be doing that. But the fact that you've got over th around 300 of these developments either completed, underway or planned, means that this is what's going to be driving nickel demand over the next decade plus it's the the fact that these these battery facilities as we see them right now are going to be voracious consumers of nickel and this is a, an estimate from benchmark nickel so where we are here is right now we see uh, uh, essentially actually this uh, this is actually being superseded because we're already producing 3.3 million tons of nickel a year and again that demand as predicted a couple of years ago was going to be batteries but in fact we're already up here and it's already being driven for higher than the, the predicted levels in this graph uh, uh, as a result of battery demand as a result of those cathodes that contain an awful lot of nickel and this just this is a uh, data from the uh, from the uh, world uh, world bank again just looking at nickel so this is 2050 annual demand from energy technologies primarily the lithium ion batteries as a percentage of production in 2018 so what we're seeing is essentially a prediction that we need to double the amount of nickel we were mining in 2018 to meet increasing demand and that annual demand from energy technologies in 2050 is about 2.2 million tons which is essentially what we produced in 2018. So if we're talking about the demand side of the nickel equation, what's driving it is lithium ion batteries and uh, uh, the, especially those lithium ion batteries with those nickel rich uh, cathode compositions. The question is, can we meet a more than 100% increase in nickel mine production by 2050? And there's other drivers here as well. As I say, if the hydrogen economy really takes off, then we're going to need more stainless steel and so on. So there are some uncertainties, but whatever happens, it looks like we're going to need much more mined nickel into the future. So the question is, can we meet these increasing demands? We understand the demand drivers, but we need to think about the supply side. Uh, last year, Gavin Mudd and myself published a, a report, an, a global inventory of reported nickel resources and reserves of 2018. This database is freely available from Economic Geology. If anybody has any trouble finding it, you can always contact me. But what we have here is a, essentially a, a large database of global nickel resources and reserves classified by mineral deposit type. And we can combine this with records of production to try and understand where we've got nickel from up to date and where we're going to get nickel from into the future. We know that the majority of nickel has been from laterites and magmatic sulfide systems. It was in last year about 50-50, but that's actually shifted thanks to increased Indonesian laterite production. Uh, the other thing to note is that all grades are generally decreasing in all deposit types. That means we need more energy to mine them, but it also perhaps means that we're getting better at actually extracting the metals from lower grade ores. Other deposits have been mined for nickel. There's some potential in various hydrothermal systems. There's some potential if we go down to the seafloor or seafloor mining. Production from these remains relatively small, and it remains to be seen whether these can actually produce significant amounts of nickel into the future. So this is a global nickel production from 1851 to close to the present day by country. 
what you've got here is essentially a, a, a very early production from Europe, the New Caledonian laterites, uh, the Sudbury field predominantly in Canada, uh, Australia with the discovery of uh, Kamatiatic deposits, uh, the Russian block and the development of the Rilsk and other systems. And essentially what you've got is a, a situation like this. But the thing to note here is that this Indonesian sector here has actually increased further as a result of their increased uh, development of laterites and, and laterite, lateritic nickel production. This is uh, uh, the proportion of sulfide and laterite. There's some other, uh, uh, some other um, uh, uh, production here. But as you can see, the present day, we're roughly 50-50 or slightly over 50-50 uh, in terms of production uh, from magmatic sulfides and from laterites. Laterites are creeping up and this trend will actually continue up to here because, of, as I mentioned, that increased production from Indonesian lateritic resources. The database we had, we identified uh, 626 nickel deposits within ground resources and reserves, including 235 laterites, 342 magmatic sulfides, and 49 others. So hydrothermal nickel alloy, so our ruite deposits, which may become important into the future, seafloor manganese nodules, and so on. These totally contain 350 million tonnes of nickel and resources. That if you convert all of that into current production rates of 3.3 million tons a year could meet around 106 years of current nickel demand, but that doesn't include increased demand as a result of the energy transition. Reserves contain about nearly 50 million tons of nickel, uh, a lot in laterites, uh, slightly less in sulfides, uh, 1 million tons in, in miscellaneous reserves. Uh, but the other thing to remember is that these are resources and reserves in the ground. Whether they actually make it into production or not is a function of a variety of things, economics, environmental, social and government and governmental challenges. So just because these things are in the ground doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be dug up and, and contribute to nickel production. We can actually uh, compare this to a previous research we did, which looked at nickel resources and reserves in 2011. Magmatic sulfide deposits, they, they seem, if they were being mined in 2011 and 2018, those resources and reserves seem to keep pace with depletion by mining, whereas laterite resources and reserves, as I'll show shortly, are lower than in 2011, suggesting an individual project from a, a laterite, an individual laterite project, once you actually delineated the resources, that delineation is more comprehensive than, say, is the case for a magmatic sulfide system, where you can expand ex brownfield exploration and actually continue maintaining that ratio of production to resource and del reserve delineation. All these values are also minimum values, so the poor reporting in some countries means that some deposits are likely missed. And it's important to remember in all of this that resources and reserves are dynamic. That 350 million tonnes that we see is not all that we'll ever have. That 350 million tonnes may, that value there in global resources may actually be fairly continuous over time as we replenish production as a result of brownfield expansion and new discovery. So this is just an example. It's important to remember that current reserves and resources are not all there is. This is the Sudbury deposits in Canada. What we've got here is cumulative production from Falconbridge and Inco, now uh, uh, Valley and Glencore. Um, what we've got here is some of the available reserves data. What you see is production is actually managed by pretty good addition of reserves and resources. Maybe a little drop off here, uh, and some of that may be as a result of a, a lack of reporting from Valet. But what you can actually see is there's a fairly good maintenance of the, the ratio of production to reserve addition as a result of brownfield expansion. And this means that we need to not only understand the geology of these systems, but also the economic situation and the social, governmental, and, and governance, uh, social, environmental, and governance issues or governmental issues. Basically, if you get these issues right and you actually start to go into production, it's likely that you're going to have mining success rather than your reserve or resource sitting in the ground for a significant number of uh, years and not actually making it into production. We can actually look at that in a bit more detail. So this is looking at uh, what we've got here is essentially 2011 resources. We've actually normalized these for cumulative production. So any of these producing data points, any of these mines that are producing are actually, uh, we've normalized for that production between 2011 and 2018. And we've got 2018 resources here. So in other words, if a mine has produced between 2011 and 2018, 
and but has also added sufficient resources and reserves to replenish that production, it would lie on this one to one line. And what you can see on average, most of these deposits lie approximately on this one to one line. So you've got a Y equals 0.995x uh, value here. So most deposits actually maintain production or, 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 or can compensate for production by the addition of brownfield resources. And this is not taking into account new discoveries in the intervening period. So this is how the magmatic sulfide equation works in terms of production versus replenishment from brownfield uh, 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 resource addition. If we look at laterites, the equation is different. So we've got a, a distinct scatter to actually depletion. So where sulfide resource is typically maintained over time, despite numerous projects pr producing a lot of nickel, laterite resources decrease over time with production. This suggests that laterite resources are, are more fully delineated early on in mining operations. So if you look at a laterite resource, that means that laterite resource is more likely to be closer to perhaps a, a total production capacity than a magmatic sulfide resource, which has a, a significant expansion potential, even with significant amounts of production. And this is important because you know both discovery and expansion can add nickel, but the sustainability of the brownfield expansion of laterites, uh, or the poorer sustainability of that brownfield expansion of laterites compared to sulfides, means that you need to actually think about what the implications of this are for modeling, uh, thinking about uh, future changes or future ability of the nickel sector to meet increasing demand via more mining. Uh, there's a few things to think about. Um, obviously, uh, if we're mining magmatic sulfides, we can often, especially in commartiatic systems, uh, generate fine-grained tailings that are, are suitable for carbon dioxide sequestration. Uh, there's a lot of work going on uh, by uh, uh, researchers like Sasha Wilson in Alberta and, and Greg Dipple up in Vancouver, who've been looking at this for a long time. This is an example from Sasha, some of uh, uh, Sasha's work. Uh, we're looking at the Mount Keith Comartiite deposit. We've got 11 million tons of serpentinite-dominated tailings being produced a year, a total resource of more than 300 million tons of mineralization. The mine alone, you know, by not actually doing anything to the tailings, you're sequestering only 4,000 tons a year of atmospheric carbon dioxide. It's probably the case for numerous other ultramafic hosted deposits. This means that mining can effectively offset some carbon dioxide produced by the mining activities that are generating the tailings. And if you think about carbon trading or, or carbon offsets into the future, this means that certainly sub-economic nickel projects have the ability to become economic if they're in a country that actually looks at carbon trading and so on. Because you could, especially if you enhance the sequestration, you could certainly get significant amounts of benefits or, or carbon benefits as a result of that sequestration, as well as revenue derived from, from things like nickel mining. And this is why these are uh, our Ruite deposits may be of significant potential just because they have so much carbon dioxide sequestration potential. And we should also think about byproduct potential from nickel operations. We know about cobalt, copper, platinum group elements, and so on, but there's significant other potential for byproduct nickel from uh, for, for byproduct other deposits from uh, like a selenium and tellurium and then scandium from magmatic sulfide and laterite uh, systems. Also thinking about expansion to unconventional nickel resources. But the key here is understanding the potential and how these elements behave during mineralization their deportment and their, how they behave during mineral processing. But it's certainly worth investigating these byproduct metals in some jurisdictions. So the, here in the US, we have federal tax breaks on critical metal production as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act. So in other words, if you're producing a critical byproduct metal from your from your system, you know, you can actually write off 10% of the cost of uh, essentially the, the, the production of that mineral that includes mining and processing uh, as a result of the fact that you're producing a mineral that the US government is considering critical. And there's similar other policy developments happening globally to try and boost these, uh, uh, these buy and co-product, the uh, critical metal production uh, statistics, and that could certainly have a significant upside for some, uh, from some nickel deposits. But start to wrap up, uh, we know that nickel resources and reserves are sufficient to continue current levels of production for several decades, but the fact is those current levels of production, current levels of demand for nickel are increasing. This also assumes that all of the material we know about can be mined and, and that demand, as I say, continues at the same level. Neither of these are true. So we may well see a number of challenges in terms of maintaining the nickel supply that we need for, for the energy transition. The nickel mining sector itself faces a number of challenges. Increased demand from the energy transition we talked a lot about. Potential supply restrictions relating to environmental, social, governmental or governance challenges. For example, there's a 
Indonesia, although they're producing a lot more nickel, they're also being coming under significant amounts of scrutiny in terms of biodiversity challenges, pollution, and so on. The increase in laterite supply is good also for the overall nickel selector, but perhaps not ideal for what we consider class one battery needs. So the, the nickel we get from magmatic sulfide systems is much more suited for use in batteries than, uh, than laterite nickel, which needs an awful lot more processing, awful lot more energy, may actually result in an awful lot more carbon dioxide emissions as a result of that processing and refining. This means that although global nickel resources and reserves appear healthy and sufficient, Rapid increases in demand, limitations on conversion of resources to reserves to production, and limited supplies of what you might consider more battery ready nickel may cause significant supply issues. And all of this means like the rest of the minerals industry, maybe even more so for this sector, there's certainly interesting times ahead for the, for the nickel industry. And that's it. Um, I just want to wrap up by saying uh, I've put my wrong email address on there. It's actually sjoward at unr.edu. Uh, we have a, a paper in economic geology last year that covers this in far more detail. I'm happy to pass on papers, this PowerPoint, and continue this discussion. And I'd also like to thank the Nickel Institute for funding this, uh, some of this research that I presented today. And with that, I'll uh, stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thanks so much, Simon. I think that's a really great setup to the, our second two speakers. All right. We'll continue on. Rebecca is an exploration geoscientist with over 23 years global multi-commodity experience with a special specialization in nickel copper PGE. She has a bachelor honors from the U University of Tasmania and her PhD from Monash University. She's worked on five continents with diverse experience across the exploration development and operations spectrum from project generation and drill outs on advanced projects to M&A on operation assets, operating assets. Rebecca is currently the Nickel SME for Rio Tinto, exploration setting, technical direction and priorities. And Rebecca, if you'd like to share your screen. You're muted. I think you're still muted, Rebecca, if you're messing around with it. Okay, unmuted now. Can you let me know? Perfect. That's yeah. Come, that's come up okay? Great. Yeah, now hey, I thanks, can see you. Excellent. Thanks very much for that introduction. Uh, and uh, I was asked to give a couple of recommendations, uh, you know, about careers and stuff. So I just thought I'd quickly show it through then at the end. You've already given an introduction to my career. Uh, my recommendations to people out there is grab opportunities and be very flexible. Everything turns out often to be, to be a great learning experience. And the other comment I would make too is that exploration is a team activity. And I think I'm really highlighting that with some of my team members that I'm showing here on the, uh, on the, on the figures to the, to the right there, the pictures. So just to flip down through here, I have the appropriate cautionary statement from Rio Tinto about if you make decisions based on what I'm saying through here. And uh, one more comment I would make that all the material that I'm showing through here, every single thing is in the public sphere and has been duly referenced here. So just to start off with, uh, nickel sulfides, which is what I'm gonna talk about today, are typically hosted in ultramafic or mafic intrusions of volcanics. They are almost always associated with conduits or lava channels. These are open magmatic systems which are processed many, many times more magma than what we see in the preserved system. These nickel sulfide deposits can range from those that are dominated by massive sulfides, for example, as we have through there at Eagle's Nest to the left, or they can uh, are a continuum, to those that are dominated by more disseminated deposits, sorry, disseminated sulfides, as the example shown there at Chinchuan. Sulfides themselves, this can occur within the intrusion or conduit in keels, and they can also be external to the deposit, but usually within close proximity. So in nickel sulfide exploration, we essentially focus on two main things. The first is that we identify the host or associated ultramafic to mafic intrusion or flow. And the second is that we look to identify sulfates that are preferably metal enriched. We identify the sulfide factor by direct observations of sulfides in our crops or boulders, evidence of a conductor, and or abundances of metals by various geochemical methods that are sufficiently elevated that can only be explained by sulfides. So 
The typical magmatic sulphide assemblage is pyrotite, pentlodite, and chalcopyrite. And luckily for us, pyrotite is extremely conductive. Electromagnetic or EM surveys rely on the conductivity contrast between pyrotite and preferably resistant or low conductivity host intrusions and country rocks. The surveys that I talked about, they rely on some degree of conductivity of the sulfides to make something that we can detect by these surveys. And for that, we need to have above about 10% sulfides ballpark. So that means we can see massive, down to heavily disseminated sulfides with EM systems, but we do not see typically disseminated sulfides. These surveys could be airborne, they can be ground, and they can even be dug within a drill hole with borehole EM. Each of these systems has some positives and negatives. Typically, airborne surveys, these cover uh, uh, are very quick and they can cover large areas. But the negative is they don't tend to see so deep. If we go to ground DM, our detection depth improves, but the negatives, these are very slow and expensive with a limited area. And then we have borehole EM, and the positives of this, it's very sensitive and it allows us to pick up near, uh, detect near misses from our drilling. But the negatives are that we are limited uh, by the detection uh, range from our borehole. However, uh, I should point out that electromagnetics are the most successful technique for picking up our nickel um, sulfide deposits, but there are complications. And the dominant one is that we can pick up other conductors, such as graphitic country rocks or iron formations. So just as a quick overview of our exploration techniques, um, I've divided our systems down through here into those systems that are dominated by massive sulfides versus those that are dominated by disseminated sulfides. And I've also further divided it down to thin cover and thick cover. Um, so remember what we talked about before, that exploration essentially comes down to picking out a host ultramafic or mafic intrusions um, and then detecting sulfides. So what this basically means, if we look at our geophysics, and I'll describe this down through here, we can, in green, this is where we're starting to look for our host intrusion. And we can do that with magnetics, and we can do that with gravity as well. Um, then when it comes down to, uh, I should point out through here, magnetics is particularly helpful when we're talking about serpentinized ultramafic rocks. These are very, uh, have a high strong mag signature that we can pick out very well. In mafic systems, where we don't often have that mag advantage, we can use instead gravity. Surface geochemistry is largely ineffective under thick cover. However, it can actually be very effective when we have areas of shallow cover. If we're talking about massive sulfides, you want to have very tight spacing. If we're going down to disseminated sulfide, uh, sulfide deposits, we can tend to have larger um, uh, spacing because of the large footprint that we have. And finally, prospecting and reconnaissance can help us find the road host rocks, gossens, and particularly sulfides if we have uh, shallow cover. We rank targets based on multiple lines of evidence. We can make a discovery based on a single one of these lines of evidence, but we tend to favour those that have multiple both geochem, geophysical and prospecting results. Uh, I should point out that discovery involves a multi-pronged team approach and is also very highly specific for ge different geographic regions and commodity styles. So just to put down that exploration sequence that we talked about. Um, so uh, first of all, to start off with, our first tool that we'll use is we're going to do our airborne mag. We're going to often do our airborne EM and maybe gravity, but that's less common. And we can do that in thick and thin cover. That's going to let us pick up our ultramafic rocks. And it's also going to let us, if we're lucky, pick up a conductor or maybe even a sulfide geochemical response. We then split out on the left-hand side here where we go through to those systems that are dominated by massive sulfides. In this case, we're going to start to think about ground EM. We're going to be looking for those conductive bodies. And then if we'll drill and with borehole EM, uh, if we miss something and hopefully we'll make a discovery with a little dance and let people down through here. And then if well, from that we'll enhance our discovery by further borehole EM and drilling. Over on the right hand side instead, we're dominated by these disseminated deposits. Uh, we'll tend to, we may do ground magnetics and ground gravity. We might do some prospecting, then cover, we'll do some geochem, but we tend to drill a lot quicker. And then again, we have our dancing people, we're making discoveries and we'll continue to drill. We may go back and pick another area to continue some of our further surveys. So that just gives you the general overview of what our, our, our prospecting sequence is. So here we're showing a graph of discovery rates or the number of discoveries versus time. 
And we're actually picking this out, whether those discoveries that are due to prospecting in blue, those that are due to geophysics in red, those that are due to geochemistry in green, and finally extension and low deposits in brown. So when we look at this graph, the first thing that we can take away is our discovery rates for nickel sulfide deposits are truly uh, declining over time. But the thing, other thing that we can take away from this is that geophysics is the dominant and most important discovery method that we have. And in general, we also note too that prospecting and mapping have dropped in time as we tend to be looking at greater depth by and large. And finally, we can see that geochemistry is of relatively uh, less important as a discovery method at the uh, deposit scale. So now I'm just gonna take you through a couple of different systems. Uh, and the first one that I'm gonna start off with here, and I'm gonna start firstly with a massive sulfide dominated systems. What I'm gonna mention down through here is the Sicardi deposit. Now Sicardi is actually uh, located in the central Lapland greenstone belt of Northern Finland, which is a paleoproterozoic rift basin. The deposit itself is associated with shallow extrusive or extrusive ultramafics in channels of conduits, and they're typically associated with chemically reactive host rock. This deposit was discovered by Anglo-American back in 2008, and importantly, this was a discovery undercover. So exploration here was originally looking for Pachenga analogues, and the discovery effectively involved them identifying ultramafics by using magnetics, as shown down through here in this figure on the left-hand side. Uh, however, in this area, there is very limited outcrop, as shown by an example of a, about the exact same swamp but a nearby swamp in Finland. Um, and so because of this, they actually moved to doing uh, systematic base of till um, drilling, where they sample um, the weather bedrock of base of till over that magnetic feature. And from this, they ended up picking up strongly anomalous copper, nickel, and also not so anomalous, but still anomalous uh, nickel, uh, sorry, copper PGE and uh, nickel. So one thing to note with this uh, deposit is that airborne EM and standard ground EM did not detect any conductors or sulfide. Despite this, they still drilled this um, uh, project and they ended up with their discovery in 2008 on the, uh, the seventh drill hole. Subsequent and more sensitive ground DM systems, such as squid, actually did end up picking up massive sulfides. And that's because the massive sulfides only start about 350 meters below surface. And just to show you some examples of what the ore look like, we've got a picture there of massive ore and also some of the stock work ore, which is a bit more peripheral to the main body. So next we're gonna flip over to the US uh, to uh, Tamarack uh, through here. So again, Tamarack is another uh, deposit that's associated with quite swampy ground. It's actually located in the Mesoproterozoic Mid-Continental Rift at about 1.1 GA. Uh, and mineralization itself is composed of massive to semi-massive to net textured sulfides associated with an ultramafic conduit with two dominant uh, peridotite phases. One's got coarse grained olivine and the other one fine grained olivine. So this deposit was discovered by Rio Tinta Exploration in 2008, and since 2014, it's been managed in the JV with Talon Metals. So the ultramafic intrusion was first picked uh, using magnetics, as we can show here on the left-hand side through here. Uh, and this is actually originally noted by the Minnesota government. And remember, ultramafics, when they're serpentinized, they tend to form magnetic highs. Early drilling of subtle EM anomalies intersected minor disseminated sulfides. However, the overlying uh, fine grain olivine unit, which you can show, see through there in the right hand side in the purple, is actually slightly conductive, which really complicated using ground surveys, and the results were not particularly successful. However, the first significant mineralization of massive and semi massive sulfides was actually found in 2008 on the 48th and 52nd drill hole, respectively. Subsequent borehole EM has actually been a critical tool and identified in all the geothermal resources. And you can see a lovely picture down through there of the massive sulfide with some loop textures and some lovely pentlandite eyes. Next, we've got the Nova Bollinger discovery. So we're flipping down to Australia now, a very different part of the world. The Nova ore deposit is located in the Mesoproterozoic Albany Fraser orogenic belt, and mineralization is associated with a melagabrin morite. This deposit was discovered in 2012 by uh, Sirius Resources. 
The initial targeting was based on the recognition of a single regional soil, nickel and copper anomaly, generated by the Geological Survey of Western Australia. And detailed targeting was focused over that I-shaped mag feature that you can see there on the left, which actually turned out to be a refolded fold. The host ultramafic and mafic rocks themselves are not particularly strongly magnetic relative to the granulite facies country rocks that are adjacent to. Gravity is somewhat helpful, as you can see a bit of a high through there uh, from the middle figure through here. But the area, what's important about it, and this picture you can see down through there are some gum trees and the terrain, the area has relatively thin cover and the soil is largely residual. Turned out to be ideal conditions for soil geochemistry. And you can see there on the right hand side, we have the copper uh, and nickel in soil response, highly elevated over that um, eye feature that we're talking about. So what they did next, they followed this up with ground DM and they identified a couple of strong conductors and they started relatively shallow at about 150 metres depth. And these were importantly below the strongest nickel and copper soil anomaly. They modelled this up to produce a Maxwell plate, which is an appropriate uh, tool that we use to uh, identify where the uh, conductor is appropriately. And that's shown down through here as that plate on the bottom right hand side. And you can see across where they drilled that conductor in the central figure and uh, they intersected that and they ended up making the discovery on this project. And just to show a couple of pictures there, you can see, so I should point out that most of the mineralization in the system is actually sulfides that have migrated down into the full wall meta sediments. But we do end up with quite um, magmatic looking textures in terms of the fact that we have these lovely um, uh, loop textures that develop in Pellandite. And finally, just for something, uh, not well, finally, of the massive section, I should say, I'm actually going to throw something in that's a little bit different to the rest. This is not a magmatic sulfide deposit. It is likely actually a uh, um, IOCG, and that is the Jaguar deposit that's located in Brazil. And this is most likely going to be the next tier one nickel sulfide deposit. It's located in the 2.7 GA Carajás belt in Brazil. And discovery year was 2007 by Ballet, and it's currently held by Centaurus Metals, uh, which is an ASX listed company. So Ballet actually started exploring this area back in 2004 for magmatic nickel sulfides, and they noted nickel sol anomalies over discrete mag features. They also noted that they had coincident mag and EM or conductor responses, but the target was subsequently downgraded because they recognised that the host rocks were in fact not ultramafic. But they came back in 2006 to actually pursue a, um, a uh, copper um, soil anomaly over an elongate mag feature looking for ISCG, and they ended up in their fifth drill hole intersecting 50 metres at 0.8% nickel. So mineralization here consists of massive breccia textures, uh, breccia sulphides, effectively in a myelinitic shear zone with a zoned alteration of magnetite amphibole. And this gives a very strong mag signature. So what we actually end up with is something that is a geochemical soil response, a mag, EM, and IP. And uh, you can see through here in the top right, that's the shear zone that's effectively mineralized that we're talking about. And here we have an example of what some of the massive mineralization looks like from this uh, unusual ISC deposit, ISCG nickel sulfide deposit. Now we're going to flip over to some disseminated systems. The first one I'm going to mention down through here is the K-Bitsa deposit. Now K-Bitsa is hosted again back in the central Lapland greenstone belt of Finland, and it has a similar age to Sakaiti at around about 2.05 GA. The deposit is composed of really metal rich and disseminated sulfides hosted in a large ultramafic to mafic intrusion. And mineralization is up there in that purple area is typically associated with the most ultramafic portion of this intrusion. The discovery here was actually made by GTK, which is the Finnish Geological Survey back in the 1980s to 1990s. And really it revolved around very systematic detailed mapping, some ground mag and gravity, picking up the large host intrusion, and then also followed up by a lot of map, further mapping and identifying surface boulders um, and a strong base of till anomaly. So just to talk through, you can see in the bottom left through there, we've got some of these mapped outcrops. I know it's a bit hard to read, but I just wanted to show you in the figure this, um, that the prospecting and mapping here was critical to picking the um, weakly mineralized surface expression. They have down the bottom there in the middle, they have this uh, 
uh, base of till liquor and copper anomaly. MAG was helpful to pick out the host intrusion, as you can see at the top right. In the center, gravity was helpful. On the other hand, EM through here was not helpful. And that is because this is a disseminated sulfide deposit. They do notice those conductors, but that's actually not the mineralization they're looking for. The mineralization that hosts from here is this very finely disseminated sulfide that you can see there on the top left. And then finally, we're going to mention the Nebo Babel discovery. This is located again, and we're back in um, uh, sort of in, in West Australia, more toward the centre. And uh, this uh, deposit is hosted in the 1060 native of Proterozoic um, uh, West Musgraves flock in Australia. It's largely composed of disseminated for some very minor massive sulfides, but it's inside a gabbronorate conduit, as I've shown down through here in this cartoon. The deposit is located under thin sand cover and does subcrop a little bit locally, and it was discovered in uh, 2000 by Western Mining. The area was first identified as a region of interest based on lithospheric architecture mapping that was strongly developed and pushed by Western Mining. Then lag surface sampling at relatively high resolution identified nickel and particularly also copper anomalism that they followed up on. AEM, as you can see in the top left through here, sorry, top right, did identify some sulfides, but was quite complex due to some paleo surface paleo channels that were mildly conductive. But one of the big problems with this area is that the host gabbronorates are really difficult with mag to actually pick out from the country rocks. So what they did here is they actually ended up using airborne gravity with a falcon system. And with this, they can well uh, identify very well the host gabbronorite intrusions. And the discovery was about 26 metres at 2.45% nickel and almost. But subsequent drilling has shown that the deposit is largely dominated by disseminated sulfides. So just some learnings to take away from this. Discoveries are mostly based on multiple lines of evidence, including mapping, surface geochemistry, magnetics, gravity, and various EM types. Geophysics is the key technique for nickel sulfide exploration, both for delineating um, uh, the host ultramafix and mafic intrusion, and also for direct detection of massive sulfide-dominated mineralization. I should point out that early collection of geophysical property data, that is your density, conductivity, and magnetic susceptibility of the country rocks, your host intrusion, and the sulfides. This is really important. This is a priority because it allows us to design, have an optimal design for geophysical programs. Geochemistry can be a useful tool for screening geophysical anomalies, particularly for uh, separating out your EM anomalies. And I should point out too that borehole room is a critical tool in discovery and expansion of existing resources, particularly as the exploration space is deepening the time. And then just to talk about some future directions down through here. Firstly, we have remote sensing, uh, particularly moving into hyperspectral satellites, and that will allow us to remotely start to pick out the right geology context and get a better understanding to look for important structures and also to pull for important country rocks too. Then we can go down to the geochemical uh, arena, and that is particularly, uh, as we now have increased availability of MLA, we can start to do a lot of work in resistate indicator minerals, for example, in tills and stream sediments. And that includes mineral chemistry for fertility, which, for example, can be zone pyroxenes or nickel with an olivine. I should point out both of these do have abundant false positives, but can still be useful. And also we can move to into the direct detection, looking for pet and great grains in till or stream sediments. And finally, we can also have hydrogeochemistry as well. For geophysics, uh, I, I've mentioned a few things about uh, EM. Uh, there's a lot of advances always happening, particularly in the borehole EM space. But one thing I'd like to point out is uh, doing passive seismics. And this is being undertaken by groups such as Fleet Space. And we can also have active seismics. They can allow us to image the intrusion and structure, that is the host system. And we should point out too that sulfides have lower velocities. So you actually potentially can pick up from sulfides as well. And one big, very obvious comment that I will make is that machine learning and AI, this is really a very important game changer. And it's allowing us to interpret large data sets, integrate these um, from multiple data streams, which allows for very fast turnaround time. And I will leave it there. Thank you so much, Rebecca.
All right, perfect. I think that was a great commentary on how important geophysics can be in, in discovering and exploring for these systems. We'll go now to our next speaker. So Mike Lesher, BSc and MA from Indiana, PhD from Western Australia, is a professor emeritus in, of economic geology in the Mineral Exploration Research Center and the Harquail School of Earth Sciences at Laurentian University, where he was research chair in mineral exploration, founding director of Merck and director of the Mines Initiative, Mining Initiatives, designer and founder of the Laurentian School of Mines, now Goodman School of Mines. He has worked on nickel, copper, PT deposits in Brazil, China, Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, Russia, and Western Australia. Chromium deposits in Northern Ontario, the geochemistry of felsic volcanic rocks associated with VMS systems, gold deposits in Ontario, Western Australia, and the Southern Appalachians, and sedimentary iron deposits in Labrador, Quebec. He has been a, an SEG Thayer Lindsley lecturer, a CIM University lecturer, and was awarded the GAC MDD Duncan Dairy Medal for his contribution to economic geology. Okay, and with that, I will let you take it away, Mike. Thank you, Lauren. Get things going here. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, research. Uh, I don't have a lot of time, so there's going to be a lot of things I'm going to miss. There'll be some people that will be annoyed at me, but um, it's just the way things go. Um, magmatic nickel copper PG deposits are, uh, in my opinion, one of the best understood examples of orthomagmatic mineralization. I think uh, chromite was recognized as being orthomagmatic much earlier, but I think you'll find there's a lot more debate on how chromite uh, deposits form than um, sulfide deposits. So there's been a lot of really good work that's been done. Um, and it's also the archetype, um, I think, of a mineral system um, was back in, well, the, the 80s that uh, Tony Aldrich recognized that, in fact, this the, the generation of a deposit of this type involved partial melting down in the mantle, transport up through the crust, uh, emplacement in a variety of different environments, that there are various things that went on to, um, let me see if I can get, uh, um, try, no, sorry, I'm not getting my laser pointer. Um, different types of, of sulfide fractionation that goes on to varying degrees, that's very important in some deposits. And then of course they've been modified uh, afterwards. Um, the other thing that's really important, and, and uh, Simon alluded to this, is that there's many secondary uh, byproducts in these. So there's a whole suite of semi-metals, uh, other base metals, a uh, full suite of PGEs, um, and so forth in these deposits. This is some data from Cambalda, normalized to primitive mantle. And um, and you can see, well, relative to primitive mantle, but there's significant abundances of things like tellurium um, and, of course, cobalt and things like that that are of interest uh, to us as, as critical metals, in addition to just the nickel. Um, I'll, I'll point out here, but I'll come back to it, that in fact, a lot of these things get incorporated when we incorporate the sulfur from the country rocks. So uh, each each uh, each deposit will have a different uh, trace element profile for these byproduct components. Uh, just some quick examples of the ores. Uh, sometimes they're massive, overlain by net textured or disseminated. It's an example from Cambalda. Uh, sometimes they have lots of inclusions in them. This is an example from Norilsk with inclusions or rafts rather of, of anhydrite plucked up from the footwall rocks. Uh, sometimes they're uh, blebby uh, like this, and sometimes these are compound, uh, basically segregation vesicles so with, uh, with um, uh, little cavities here that have been uh, filled by secondary minerals. This is also from Norilsk. Uh, here at Sudbury, sometimes they, they form breccias like this, where we've got fragments of quartz diorite and semi-massive uh, uh, copper pore sulfides. And then uh, these are now uh, various uh, variably uh, fractionated sulfide blebs and residual MSS, uh, basically high temperature uh, pyrotite uh, in quartz diorite. Um, below Sudbury, uh, the contact deposits here 
have uh, often on the North Range, especially large zones of, uh, of vein type mineralization. This is one particularly large vein, uh, the Podolsky deposit. You can see the width here. These are some of the grades. These are very rich and they're a high priority these days for, for mining in Sudbury. And then the peripheral parts of those um, have bornite and millerite uh, with lots of silver and lead and things like that in them. Uh, other deposits, Rebecca, I think, showed an example of Jinchuan. And uh, this is what the bulk of the ore there uh, looks like, this uh, net texture where the sulfides form a continuous network to olivine crystals. And, uh, and, and I had a student, Nicola Tunnelier, do a PhD on some of the textures here. And these have very small, down to as low as 14 degree dihedral angles here, indicating that the sulfides were wetting uh, the olivine. And this, uh, based on some experimental work by James Bernan and colleagues, uh, indicates that the FO2 was high. And then there's uh, disseminated mineralization. Uh, Rebecca talked a lot about this. This is uh, some mineralization from Mount Keith, um, where um, the sulfides are interstitial to olivines here. And because they're ser serpentinized, the olivine, or rather the nickel that was in the olivine, is now entered at the sulfide and converted what would have been originally been a typical pyrotite, hetlandite, calcopyrite type assemblage with very minor calcopyrite in this case, because of the high nickel content of the magma, uh, converts that to mainly pentlandite. And, um, and as Simon noted, in some cases, you can even get a war white, uh, which is an iron nickel alloy. So what do we know about these deposits? Well, uh, so they can be almost any age. They occur pretty much throughout geological time. Uh, their tectonic settings are mainly rift related, at least by abundance. There are some that are sort of more transtensional, like a lot of the deposits in perhaps in China. And, um, but they don't form in mid-ocean ridge uh, type environments. The mantle sources can be depleted. In other words, normal, a sphenospheric uh, peridotite, or they can be metasomatized peroxide, like many of the deposits in, uh, in China. Parental magma, basically anything more mafic than morb, Sudbury is an exception, but it's an exception about everything. Uh, location, near a craton margin, because that allows the magma to be focused along that as it comes up under a craton, or a, a translithospheric fault, which allows magma access. Host units, uh, as Rebecca noted, these are lava magma, magma channels, channelized sheet flows or sills, channelized dikes or chonoliths. Uh, those, are, those are the key exploration target. And they're the thing that we really have the least understanding of, in my opinion, about how to predict where these are in the subsurface. Host lithologies are various cumulate rocks, as we'll see. The middle source is normally the magma, and the sulfur source is, uh, in my opinion, and, and many others, uh, primarily the country rocks. Um, we know the basic processes, uh, at least we think we do, that, that this involves thermomechanical erosion of the sulfur-bearing country rocks, that sulfide xenomelts melts are generated because the solubility of sulfur is so low in silicate magmas that the metal tenors in those originally barren or sometimes mineralized uh, xeno melts get upgraded by reaction with the magma. Uh, and then that there's some sort of gravitational or fluid dynamic segregation of the emissible sulfides from the silicate liquid um, and, and the rest of the things that are formed. Sorry. Um, yeah hit the wrong button. Um, the ore is localized uh, typically along contacts and footwall embayments. It can be in dil dilational jogs and dikes, or there can be internal strata bound disseminations. Um, ore tenors, uh, that's the metal in 100% sulfides, varies with magma composition, something Tony Naldrit and, well, in fact, Vocht and, and, and very early workers recognize that, and with uh, Something that Ian Campbell and Tony Nalder worked on was the magma to sulfide ratio, which is called the R factor. The more magma the sulfide sees, the more metal it can extract from that magma. Um, as I mentioned, some of the ores are fractionated, where basically uh, monosulfide solid solution, uh, high temperature pyrotite and ISS, which is complicated, but high temperature calcopyrite type things, uh, can segregate from residual sulfide liquid like we saw in that example at Sudbury. And finally, the mineral mineralogy is pretty simple, um, basically primarily pyrotite, pentline, calcopyrite, and different comp 
um, proportions uh, with or without uh, a little or a lot of magnetite and then platinum group uh, minerals, which can be alloys, sulfides, sulfarsenides, and so forth. So if we look at one of these systems, we have a mantle source down here someplace. The magma comes up. In this case, I've shown a sedimentary basin, but could be any sort of suitable environment. And we think that the mineralization tends to be localized in places that are the most dynamic, so that they have the most heat and the highest magma flux for upgrading R factors and things like that, and where they have access to sulfur. In this case, I've indicated this is some sulfur-bearing sediments. It doesn't need to be a sediment. It can be a VMS deposit. It can be anything. Um, and so we need to flow through part of the system, which all these little ones satisfy that. Um, uh, blind parts of the system, like up here, where this comes up here, down here, even if it intersects sulfide, won't be dynamic enough to be able to incorporate the sulfur from the sulfur source. So that's not good. And situations where you don't encounter any sulfide are not going to be good. So this is sort of simple, but this is the, seems like the basic picture. And the hard part, as I mentioned, and the really hard part uh, is, is understanding this part of the system, being able to predict uh, if you can't image it easily, uh, the locations of, 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 of these parts of the system. And of course, this is all extremely complex. Every intrusive system is going to be completely different. And there are so many variables that it's almost impossible, well, literally impossible, to, uh, to model these. Uh, the host units that Rebecca talked about. Um, so this is sort of a, a, a scheme here of different shapes of things. And the ones that are the, the the more channelized tend to have more cumulate rocks in them. Uh, they may or may not be differentiated. So these blues are meant to be gabbros and the purples here are meant to be peridotites or dunites. So the, those are the ones that tend to be the most mineralized, basically the channelized things. And all the things in here, no matter what the shape, uh, that are either undifferentiated and non-cumulate or just differentiated and non-cumulate are, are not going to be mineralized typically. There are some small exceptions, but not very many. So this is the basic model. It, it's essentially the same for an extrusive situation as an intrusive situation. The magma comes up. It incorporates uh, sulfur from the source. It's flowing turbulently, or it could be laminarly, as it turns out. But, but you know, it's flowing uh, enough so that it's able to um, thermomechanically erode the uh, the sulfur source. Um, and and it, there's uh, typically a small thermal aureole in an extrusive system, but a much wider thermal aureole, like at Norilsk, for example, in, uh, in the case of intrusive deposits. Sometimes it's not so obvious because if, if it's intruded at depth, then there's not much of a temperature contrast uh, with the country rocks. But if it's intruded at high level, as they were at Norilsk, then you, you see a very large uh, metasomatic and thermal aureole. Some recent research, and again, I. I haven't list, begun to list any of this. I've sort of, um, you know, there's a lot more pe people working on some of the more exotic magma types like Dave Hallwell or working on very deep deposits like Marco Fiorentini or uh, Sarah Jane Barnes's and, and Sarah Dare's group at, uh, at the University of Quebec Chicoutimi working on mineral chemistry. And uh, of course, uh, Wolf Meyer and Will Smith's work on, on layered intrusions. That's, that's all great. I know less about that. So I'm not going to talk about that. I think some of the most important things are understanding the nature of those intrusions, which I talked about. Physical transport of sulfides, there's been a lot of recent research on that. Uh, it's becoming quite sophisticated in terms of the type of modeling that can be done. The role of gas bubbles in aiding the, uh, the, the transport of sulfides, we'll see that uh, that has some interesting consequences. Um, I've been working on volatilization of sulfur and other things at Sudbury, and it turns out I think there's some implications for other deposits too, because it's going to change their byproduct uh, uh, element profile. And then um, Michelle Lulay at the GSC and I have been working on a more exploration-oriented uh, deposit classification, which isn't that big a deal, I guess. Classification schemes are not hugely useful, except I, I think this gives you a way to at least focus the way you might look at uh, the deposits, because each one in a different class is, is slightly different. And, and what we do now is looking at them in ways that are, makes them not so different. So um, settling, just really quick. Uh, sulfides 
are more dense. They have a density of about four, 4.2 uh, grams per cc. And um, if you do the settling calculations, a one to two centimeter sulfide droplet would settle along this line here. And at this size here, one to two centimeters would be something that could be supported in the magma and carried up uh, during uh, you know, magma ascent at, at typical velocities. Um, olivine grains are much more easily transported, but that, of course, is why you see lots of olivine fenacris in magmas and very few sulfide droplets in magmas. I'll come back to that. Um, it, it transport's very different when it's vertical than when it's inclined and when it's horizontal. When it's vertical, basically, you know, all the all the flow is straight up and you can support little droplets like this or little bubbles of the silicate melt can go down with the sulfides. And depending on the rate at which things are going up, you can carry those things. Same applies to chromite. When you tilt things, then things become very different and you get a slug of sulfide that of course is much larger and it's going to settle much more rapidly. And then uh, you can basically get complete counter current flow uh, when you when you have it inclined enough. Horizontal transport is much easier. There's a really fantastic paper uh, by Yao Magal um, on, on this doing doing some modeling. And uh, basically, you know, I think sulfides can be transported horizontally under almost any kind of flow uh, in a variety of different uh, mechanisms. Um, so that that's pretty easy. Um, I think anybody that's ever worked on these deposits would recognize that, that the sulfides are generated upstream and, and end up downstream trapped in, in topographic lows. But this creates a paradox. So fine sulfides are should be transportable in normal magmatic set rates and alpha occur in some volcanic intrusions. But if you look at the deposits and 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 where there are mineralized intrusions and where there are overlying lavas that are related to them, there's there's either no sulfides in those lavas, or if there is, those sulfides have formed there, like at Cambalda, for example. Um, I guess there's no intrusions below Cambalda, but they formed it in lavas, or if we go to the Abitibi belt, there's intrusive and, and extrusive deposits. But if you go around the world and look at flood basalts, for example, and the intrusions that feed them, Norilsk is a good example, and look in the intrusions, you can find lots of sulfides at Norilsk in the intrusions, and there are none in the overlying lavas. In, in fact, there's, there's no indication that there ever were any, and I'll come back to that a little bit. So there's some potential solutions. There's a whole list of them here. I talk about them in this paper. And the only two that are worth considering, in my opinion, or that weren't as easily dismissed, is that sulfide droplets may have been lost due to degassing. In other words, that we may have been able to bring sulfides up, and they may have been in those lavas, but then they decast, and, 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 and so the sulfur was lost. And that explains that we can move sulfides around, but that, in fact, they, they, they were lost from the lavas and only retained in, in the intrusions. And the other is that sulfide settles as settled as slugs, pseudo slugs, or uh, pseudo layers. So the degassing can 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 be uh, excluded pretty easily on the basis of the platinum group element contents. And so this is the the amount of palladium in the in the bulk magma, and this is the amount of palladium in in a, in a sulfide droplet. And what you can see here is is that 10 ppb is a normal sort of palladium content for a magma, you know, within an order of magnitude, uh, or well, much less by a factor of two maybe. And and anything above that, anytime you add small amounts of sulfide, so these are the, the amounts of the sulfide along here, and this just happens to be the amount of metal that's in that sulfide droplet, which is gonna vary with the R factor that we talked about, then all of those end up with very high PG content. So if we had degassed the magma, in other words, if we're able to transport sulfides all the way up, then we should see high PG contents, even if it's degassed. And we don't see that. If you compile the data and look at it, look at flood basalt data, then, um, then they're not enriched. So the, the other uh, option, and the one I favored in, in, in that paper, was that, that although we didn't necessarily need to form slugs, that what could happen is, is that we might have pseudo slugs or pseudo layers 
where small amounts of droplets may be held apart um, from interacting and, and the way the fluid dynamic people like Jesse Robertson and Steve Barnes and, and people have argued um, will keep them apart, but that they behave and have a bulk density that's much greater. And uh, so I think that's probably the explanation of why things can't get all the way up. So the, the conclusion, in case you haven't followed me all the way along here, is, is that I don't think sulfides get transported vertically very far. I think where we find them is where they formed. And that the reason that we don't have sulfides being carried all the way up into lavas um, is not just because they're trapped in the intrusions, but because they formed in the intrusion. So I think, or at least along, you know, upstream along the same stratigraphic level. Um, gas bubbles are really interesting. If you do some density calculations, so this is density here, and the volume of the dispersed phase, which might be uh, chromide or sulfide melt or uh, vesicles in sulfide melt. Um, that in, in, if you look at the sulfide, the sulfides had density up here, like where I said. And so you can't carry very much sulfide. You get basically to the density of the crust where the bulk density is gonna to be too high for it to ascend through the crust. And that's how most magmas come up. Um, and so you can carry about 13%, I think I, calculated, yeah, down here. On the other hand, if you allow the sulfides to be attached to uh, vapor bubbles, and for some weird reason, I wrote silicate in there, that should be a, a gas bubble, um, then you can actually carry up to 70% sulfide as long as the ratio of sulfide to vesicles, uh, sorry, that's wrong. You can carry those sulfides um, as long as they've got 30% vesicles with them. So this is a way of actually being able to carry sulfides because it reduces their bulk density quite a lot. So you can carry up to about that much. Okay, um, we saw these before. These are the segregation vesicles at Norilsk. So the idea is then that these sulfides were able to be carried. They're flattened here under their own weight because they were liquids. Uh, and they're now fractionated uh, as part of the crystallization process into what was MSS and what was residual sulfide liquid, but they all have these, these silicate caps, which would have been um, a gas bubble and now filled with, with alteration phases, chlorite and, and amphibole and things like that. The problem with this is, is a way to make lots of nickel deposits is that most deposits don't have this. They're very common at neurals. They're very common in other places. Uh, Black Swan, for example, Steve Barnes has worked on that, um, but they're not very common at other places. Uh, there's a few at Raglan, but not very many. Um, and so I don't think this is a viable way to get sulfides up from, from deeper in the crust. Now, the uh, next thing I want to talk about a little bit is the lateralization. Like I said, we've been working on this in Sudbury. It's a meteorite impact. Nobody's going to argue too hard that you might not have lateralized some things there. Uh, it turns out it has important implications for the timing of how the ores form, because if they need to exolve and during cooling of the impact melt and settle, that's a very slow process. And there are some other time constraints on dike and placement and things like that that I don't have time to talk to. The other alternative though is, is that if we had volatilized the sulfur and it was reacquired by melting the rocks after the impact melt was generated, then that in fact is very rapid. Thermomechanical erosion, especially of uh, you know xenoliths and things like that, impact debris is very rapid. And it got me to thinking that, in fact, if we're going to worry about and be interested in the byproducts of things we're mining anyway, and that we might want to get significant amounts of byproduct metals out of our nickel sulfide deposits, then the loss of volatiles might be important because a lot of those volatiles are going to be acquired from, let's say, the sedimentary uh, rocks that, are, that, are, that contain the sulfur. And it, the loss is going to be significant in lavas that are in place subaerial or in shallow water, but we can predict that uh, by looking at the rocks. Um, but it's going to be negligible in intrusives and lavas and placed into deep water. So it's going to the any volatilization is going to reduce the abundance of these elements in the ores, many of which are increasingly valuable byproducts. So I think you know there's room for for some application of this. We were able to work out the amounts of lead and uh, and 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 um, and and Baltz and his colleagues were able to work out the amount of zinc and um, and so forth that were lost. Um, and we think about 99% of the sulfur uh, was lost. 
That's shown on here. Uh, there's other ways to look at this. The meteorite impact people work on this a lot. Uh, that's the diagram I often show. This is a plot of the amount of uh, all these things in the gas phase and in the silicate melt. And uh, up here, uh, sulfur have been lost 99%. This is the one-to-one -one line right here. Uh, arsenic and lead, about 50% loss. Um, where are we? Selenium, tellurium, these are on our list of, of, of things we're interested in, and those are 99% lost. So I think this can have a significant impact on, the, like, like I said, the byproduct uh, metal inventory. Uh, the last thing is a classification. I don't want to dwell on this too much. Just uh, most of the app, this has always bothered me that the, the classifications have been based on age or tectonic setting or magma type and the mineralization type. Um, I've even done a lot of that myself. Uh, but it turns out that doesn't really help you very much because, you know, until you find the mineralization, um, a lot of these things aren't, aren't really uh, worked out. You know, maybe you can predict what some of them are. Uh, you maybe you're using some of these things to guide you, but at the end of the day, there's too wide a range of age, tectonic setting, magma type, and mineralization type for that to be, you know, maybe a useful uh, exploration classification. Um, and this is because they've formed, you know, in, in all these different ways, and, and that's not really important to whether you can find the nickel or not. So a more practical uh, classification, I think, is uh, impact melt sheets. They're obviously unique or semi-unique. There might be another one or two. Um, layered ultramafic intrusions. So there's good examples in here. They typically don't have a lot of sulfide in them. Uh, Duluth is an example of one that does, but it's not a typical layered intrusion. It's more a multi-phase intrusion. Um, Stillwater has very small amounts of sulfide. Uh, Muskox has, has a bit more. And and the Bushveld, as we know, has the Platte Reef and, and things like that. But, you know, by and large, the amount of of sulfide that's that's in these is 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 relatively small uh, compared to some of these other sources, in particular this group, channelized mafic, ultramafic lava sills and dikes. These are the ones that Rebecca talked about, and so you know Dumont in Quebec, uh, Raglan and Expo in northern uh, in Nunavik, uh, Thompson, Voises Bay, Cambalda, Mount Keith Perseverance and WA. The Rolls Talnock and Pechenga in Russia. These are these are the giants and super giants of, of nickel sulfide deposits. There's also mavic, ultramafic pikes, plugs, and stocks. There's various types, so I haven't done a fine breakdown of this, but Lynn Lake's an example of that, Montcalm in Ontario, Giant Mascot BC, and Jim, Jim Bulaki in China are basically zoned complexes. A lot of these are, you know, um, um, Alaskan or um, type 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 complexes um, or Uralian complexes. Um, and then finally, a group on orogenic peridotypes. These are the ones that, that ha might uh, potentially have very small sulfide contents, but you can also, like a Dakar here, get uh, a war white. And, um, and, and, and so those, those are potentially uh, good exploration things for the future when we, when we have more demand and, and more requirements. So there's a lot of variation in, in those groups, uh, but I think breaking those down into those groups, looking for these is very different for looking, looking at these and different looking at these. Each of them have different characteristics and the mineralization in these is very distinctive and different, even though a lot of them form from similar magma types. Um, got some features here. I'm gonna skip over that because I'm running a bit late. Um, so what's important at the end for exploration, I think uh, a source of large amounts of sulfide undersaturated magma over a short time period. Mantle plumes are quite good, but not the only way to do that. Craton margins are crustal scale faults to focus magma migration. An environment of a placement containing an external source of sulfur. Um, it could be any kind of, 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 of source. Uh, VMS mineralization is what the least VMS type uh, was the source for Namu Lake, for example, and it had an anomalous copper lead and zinc contents because of that. Uh, high flow dynamic environment uh, and a favorable site for ore deposition, which in my opinion uh, is are the or sub-horizontal parts of magmatic system. And there are minerals, there are mineralization in dikes, but a lot of those have been shown to be blade-shaped dikes or chonoliths. And there are there is mineralization in little jogs and dikes. Uh, but it's being trapped in the subhorizontal parts by and large. I don't think there's a very easy way to sort of suspend sulfides in the middle of the dike while it slowly freezes. 
Um, so what's not critical? I'm going to go through this super quick. Magma composition, the amount of partial melting, the degree of partial melting, the magmatic volcanic setting, uh, meaning volcanic or subvolcanic or intrusive, stratigraphic level. None of those matter. We can form deposits in all of those. So the remaining, remaining research problems, in my opinion, are is there a limit to how far mineralization can form from a craton margin? That's the drawback of that particular model is, is that, that sometimes the magmas, as we all know, in, in large igneous complexes can flow hundreds of kilometers, thousands of kilometers from where it was intruded. Is there a limit to how far sulfides can be transported? And I, I mean mainly vertical. Um, I think horizontal, subhorizontally, it's pretty easy. I think the fluid dynamic, dam, dynamics on this, though, are really tough. Um, there's some super nice models out there, but but it's just, it, you know, these systems are just so complex. They're impossible to, you know, parameterize, except after the fact. And how do we identify, and I think this is the really hard part, identify the subvolcanic parts of magmatic plumbing systems when they're not exposed. I, I, I agree with Rebecca. I think seismic has a great potential and passive is even better, but it's expensive. Uh, so expensive that they don't do much of it even in Sudbury. And um, I, I don't know if they do any in, 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 in Russia, but uh, there's some being done in WA test cases, I think. But um, anyway, I, I think that has the greatest potential. But until we're going to treat these things like oil fields um, and, and the value is going to be similar to an oil field, um, well, that may change too. Um, then I think seismic's uh, going to be tough. How can we identify the places where sulfides are actually localized? So uh, Rebecca you know, knows much more about this than I do. Uh, magnetics and gravity and, and EM should be in there, of course, are, are really only useful for shallow, shallow mass of ores. Um, the fluid dynamic modeling, as I've mentioned now, it's tough, but I, th I think really you know, maybe that combined with the seismic to understand the the volcanic plumbing systems can help us predict where the sulfides might be because in all cases they're usually not the target it's the host rocks that are the target like 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 Rebecca mentioned and finally just a plug for megsol.org that's our website of people who work on nickel sulfides there's an upcoming meeting at lakehead uh, so you can just type that into your browser and it'll take you to the website for that there's abstracts from some of the previous meetings in there and and other information. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mike. All right, I think we should start our Q&A. I know we're running a bit behind, so I wanna give panelists as much time to answer questions as possible. So first up, uh, we have a couple questions in the Q&A and I wanna get to Simon first, cause I know he's, uh, cause he hasn't <laughs> spoken in a while. Uh, Aaron Marsh, uh, question for Simon. Is there any difference in resource delineation in the various nickel laterite types by mineralogy? Um, not really. I mean, the, the fact is that the, the you know, laterites that are being explored for these days are all fairly close to surface and the delineation process is fairly um, somewhat uniform. I mean, it varies a bit in mineralogy and the like, but uh, the, 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 the reason we see that um, that difference in, for example, the, the 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 kind of brownfield expansion potential of sulfide magmatic sulfide systems versus laterites, I think, is just purely because laterites are nearer to surface and they're more easily delineated. And you, in that initial delineation stage, you do get more of the total amount of potential mineralization delineated than you would perhaps in a in a in a in a magmatic sulfide system where they could extend significantly to depth. Um, we do see more oxide. Uh, let me just quickly double check. I'm going to get the numbers right. We do see more oxide resources uh, than hydrous magnesium silicate resources than clay silicate resources, but that's just a function of, uh, I think, uh, kind of the, the laterites we're actually discovering these days. So I think it is just the fact that they're close to surface that means that they're, they're more easily delineated. And as a result, you get a better idea of what total resources might be early on in the. 
Just to add another comment down through what Simon's saying, we have to be very careful to actually make sure that we're delineating the differences between our oxide zones and our saprolite zones and our clay zones, because, you know, you've got pretty tight feed from what can go in, there can be quick changes. And depending on, you know, really getting that tight, I mean, in a way, sulfides are different to, to laterites. Laterites, easy to find, but processing wise, it can be quite restricted. Sulfides, on the other hand, tend to be, I'm not going to say more uniform, but a little bit easier. So uh, getting that transition right and getting that drill spacing down that allows you to actually pick up that granularity and differences can be very critical and getting those interfaces right and where those changes occur. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Rebecca. And do you want to speak somewhat to the difference in exploration techniques um, as to sulfides versus laterites and 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 what your uh, what your stance might be sometimes on the ESG impacts of both. Uh, look, uh, uh, I'll, 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 uh, look, I'll just make the comment that in terms of if we're looking at um, sulfides versus laterites, we're looking at about a five to ten times increase between uh, like as much like ten five to ten times more CO two emissions for laterites versus sulfides. So there's a very, very big difference. Uh, we also have the difference too, of course, that uh, we have uh, increased tailings by and large from um, for most laterites. Uh, um, and we also have a much larger footprint, which then in turn tends to actually come back to our biodiversity impacts. However, saying that we do know where the laterites are, which means that it's easier to provide supply versus sulfides are typically more of a challenging asset to, to, to identify, but very much as noted by Simon, when we find a sulfide deposit, most sulfide deposits tend to really grow after initial discovery. I think that's a good point. And kind of goes into a, another question that we have in the chat, um, and either for Simon or Rebecca, as you see fit, uh, is there sort of an impact with low-grade nickel laterite deposits? What could be the impact of technology development in as far as maybe in situ recovery? I mean, it, it, it's the case for any mineral deposit system where you have a, essentially a, um, an increase in um, uh, production capacity. What you might see is a, uh, in the case of nickel, we're gonna see, we're already seeing increases in demand. And if we bring more low grade nickel laterite on as a result of say hydrometallurgy and thing developments and so on, then uh, that would just act to make that demand. and. If we don't have increase in nickel production full stop, we're going to potentially run into trouble in terms of uh, 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 meeting what we need for the energy transition and so on. So I think um, uh, any developments we see, whether it's um, enhanced production from our Ruite deposits or, or low grade nickel laterite deposits, I think is going to be a positive boost for making sure we can, we can meet the challenges of the energy transition. And, and I'll probably just make one more comment about in-situ um, uh, leaching technologies. You're going to have to be very careful when you do it. Um, obviously, like uh, as uh, Simon uh, was saying, a uh, majority of the world's <clears throat> laterites that we're mining right now and look to mine in the future are particularly in places like Indonesia and Philippines. And these are areas that are very seismically active and also have quite uh, challenging uh, hydrological regimes, very, very large rainfalls. So in terms of in situ leaching, um, I mean, that, that, that can be a negative through there. And obviously a positive will be that you will have a significantly smaller footprint and you're also going to reduce your tailings down. But you'd be wanting to be quite careful when you're doing it, you know, having it situ leaching in a, uh, <clears throat> a seismically active zone, that could be uh, uh, a little bit challenging. Absolutely. And more, I guess, on the, the processing questions. Is there uh, any reason to look at the waste dumps in ongoing mines? And is there a potential there for low grade material recovery? I think so. I mean, there's a global move to look at mine waste these days and um, for either metals we missed the first time around or critical metals that we didn't weren't interested in. And the same applies for kind of the low grade nickel you might find in mining waste that uh, was mined for other commodities. So I think there's a, a huge range of opportunities in mine waste and essentially uh, 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 you get the two for one because you could remove environmental problems as well as securing increased nickel or, or any metal supply. So certainly there's the scope for looking at uh, wealth from waste uh, globally. Yeah, totally agree. It's a real win-win, isn't it? You know, you uh, get to make money while you're potentially cleaning things up and then uh, it also leads into some of those extra uh, you know, uh, CO2 sequestration that you were talking about before, Simon, as well. Absolutely. I think we have 
We have time to answer a few more questions if our panelists can stay on, but they can drop as they need to. Um, and we want to be respectful of everybody's time. So I know there's quite a lot of questions that were generated by Mike's talk. So I'm going to scroll through here. And um, there's actually one from Greg Waters that Rebecca earmarked for answering to thinking about comatiites, though not entirely exclusively. What are your thoughts on using calculated R factor as analogy for specific sulfur, sulfur saturation systems, implications being separating individual comatiite flows? I'm going to put that to Mike, actually. I, that was an accident. I was trying to answer a little bit of it, but that's really in Mike's wheelhouse. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, all, all I know is it varies, and it varies quite a bit. So we've done some work at uh, at Cambalda, and the ore tenors there can range from, I don't know, 8% uh, percent nickel uh, up to about 22% nickel, and individual sh shoots at Cambalda and deposits near there like Nepean and, and things like that. Uh, the same at um, at Raglan. Um, I don't have the numbers quite as well on that. Uh, they, they're not as high because the magma wasn't as magnesium, but the R factors at Cambalda range from about 100 to 500, and the R factors at Raglan va varied from about 300 to 1100, calculated two different ways, once by me and once by Sarah Jane Barnes using completely different methods. And uh, so um, I don't, I haven't found any way to reliably predict that because the nature of the host rock, uh, the, the host rock fills up and gets flushed out after the ore forms in a lot of these comatiatic systems. So the sulfides are at the bottom. And then we, we found at Cambalda, for example, that the rocks that are immediately over the ores, and this was exactly the opposite of what we expected, have the least amount of contamination and the least amount of sulfide in them of, of any of the rocks uh, in, in, in the system, and that the rocks that actually interacted with those sulfides are best preserved as flanking fasces on those, those lower units. So there's, I guess, I guess the bottom line is, is that when you flush out the channel like that and reset everything and then crystallize all the olivine after the sulfides, then, you know, being able to recognize, you know, how dynamic that, that lava channel was becomes difficult. Uh, and Mike, I know... Oh, go for yeah. it. Well, I was going to do this one other one that I was typing furiously that didn't answer very well um, about... Uh, the deposit where VMS horizon, that was NAMU Lake, N-A-M-E-W, Lake in Manitoba, it's south of Thompson, unrelated to Thompson. There's a paper in Economic Geology with Tom Menard as the senior author, 1996. And uh, there's also a little bit of a discussion on it with a better model from improved thought and methods uh, in, in my 2017 paper in Ore Geology Reviews. Great, thanks. I know you were talking sort of about the, there's no problem for the sulfides to be trans, uh, transported uh, horizontally, but we have a couple of questions in the chat about their vertical transport. So you can you talk a little bit about the impact of pressure change from lithostatic to hydrostatic, what effect that has, and then maybe also the effect that the solubility change as a function of pressure has. Yeah, so we've known for instance, since the work of Rick Ventland, which was re reproduced by Hugh O'Neill uh, and John Mavrogenes, um, that the solubility of sulfur actually decreases, sorry, increases, increases as you decrease pressure. So in other words, if you're carrying little sulfide droplets up from the mantle, which is what we thought happened way back, uh, what happens is, is that those will be dissolved on the way up. Now, the solubility of sulfur in a magma, and this is really important, is very small. It's like 1,600 ppm in a commodiite. It's closer to 1,000 in a basaltic magma. So you simply can't dissolve much sulfide in a, in a magma. And no matter what you do to it, if you increase the pressure and increase the solubility or decrease the pressure, sorry, decrease the pressure and increase the solubility or increase the pressure and decrease the solubility, then 
you know, in a chamber that's filling and pressurizes and depressurizes and all that, that's still a minuscule amount of sulfur that's going to ever be exolved. You're never going to exolve it quantitatively anyway, uh, no matter how you, uh, how, how much you, uh, you know, contaminate it or, or change its composition. Um, looking at some of the others. Can I, I, I have a little bit more? There's so many that you need to type answers to. I'm going to ask one more question, I think, and I think both you and Rebecca can answer. Um, can what's the really add a little bit more through there, by the way? Um, redox oh, yeah. changes, not just from sulfur, are also probably very important as well, because that can have an impact in us changing from uh, sulfate to sulfide. And that is probably particularly important for examples like Sicardi, where we're quite shallow. And also that inverse pressure relationship that Mike's alluding to, that means when you're shallow, it takes a lot more effort to sulfide saturate, probably more contamination. When you go deeper, it probably doesn't take very much effort to actually contaminate it. So there are some quite differences in what is triggering or the, the type of contaminants as well. So that's what, we, that's what we're noticing, and that's an area that we're actually trying to understand better. Great. Thanks so much. So the question that I wanted to get to, um, there's so many in the chat. So if you guys can type answers, go for it. Um, is there a relation to PGEs, the entire suite, and nickel minerals? Um, and what, if so, are there better geophysical tools to hone in on higher grades? Maybe Rebecca, you can take that one. Uh, so look, one of the things, and Mike's a, uh, maybe this is a, a bit in the Mike's field, but I'll quickly say this. Um, there's a difference when you've got commodities, the highest, uh, um, uh, those with the uh, highest degree of partial melting, they tend to have low, like sort of not the highest PGEs. You go down to this kind of sweet spot where you're talking about things that are high in geo or uh, commodiotic basalts, you know, like the 18 to like around that, you know, 12% MGO on the parental magma, they have lots of copper, lots of nickel, and they're the best PGEs. When you go down to those that are getting more of the Voices Bay range or orogenic systems, these are lower MGO parental magnets, those guys tend to have a bit more copper, a little bit relatively less nickel, but they have low PGEs in general. So in terms of detection techniques, um, it, look, look, but so, so, so actually, just dialing that back from what I was saying. So, in terms of looking for those PGA systems, it's a matter really of probably focusing <clears throat> on the direct kind of composition that you want to have. If you're looking down these orogenic systems, these lower MGO parental melts, it is not the best area to be looking for PGEs. You want to be looking a bit higher. But then, in terms, of, so that that is really the dominant control. And exploration wise, they are pretty much the same. Um, in terms of, you know, how we look for sulfides, a lot of those empirical tools that we use or, or direct detection. Great, thanks. And just uh, just as a really quick insert here, I know you talked a little bit about soil geochemistry and how that's not very useful in deep cover, but how about the nickel-chromium ratio in soils? Can you speak to that a little bit, Rebecca? Well, I'm going to bring up a, uh, 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 Mike was my postdoctoral supervisor for many years, and this is going to link back to uh, a comment from him. Nickel chrome ratios work very well on commodities. They do not work as soon as you go down to the foliatic systems or the high NGO, because, you know, you're relying on, the, yeah. So, Mike, if you want to add more to that, that's something that, so when, well, just, just uh, that's one little point I'd make is when we're using our lovely nickel diagrams that IO Gas is kindly providing us, they work really well in commodities. They do not work so as well in foliatic systems. Do you want to add more to that, Mike? No, you're exactly right. Um, and the reason I listen the reason, to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, the reason is quite simple. Commodities uh, basically crystallize only olivine, and uh, whereas a commodiotic basalt is already going to be saturated in in chromite, and so you'll uh, crystallize um, along the olivine chromite cotectic in a ratio of about 100 to one olivine to one chromite, and uh, and then they continue going down from there all the way through uh, basalts. So uh, very different behavior, and the this was first recognized by you know Western mining uh, back in the 70s when I was a student there, and um, yeah, and so it 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 holds it holds great hope there. But as soon as you go to Raglan, everything is chromite saturated. Yeah, absolutely. And at that point, you're actually better looking for your uh, copper and PGA enrichment in that sense. So yeah, yes. great, like that, those diagrams that are in iogas, great in commodities, don't use them outside commodities. Very interesting. Um, do either of you have any thoughts? I think this should be maybe our last question. Any thoughts on the viability of low grade silicate ores that are being promoted by juniors in the Timmins area? 
Ah, yes. Um, I'm going to offend somebody if I answer truthfully. Uh, well, let me put it this way. I think everything's fair game when we need a lot of nickel. And uh, those deposits have extremely low nickel grades. Um, some of it is, you know, potentially very nicely recoverable. If it's a war white, it's going to be magnetic. So nothing simpler. Uh, Simon mentioned these have the ability to offset some of their, um, you know, energy uh, carbon or energy costs by, you know, carbon capture, because if it's a serpentinite, um, then it, it can, you know, uh, react with the atmosphere. I'm not sure how that works very well in terms, I guess you've got to pile it out in the air, not underwater. And anyway, I have no expertise in that, but there's some potential for that. But they are very low grade. And I I'll have to admit to anybody um, that I'm not a big fan of mining really low grade things. And, and that applies to gold or copper or anything where we're digging everything out and recovering extremely small amounts. I know it's economic and and but I just think that's a silly way to do it. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of underground mining of high-grade nickel sulfide deposits. When you're done, you can't even see it. That Namu Lake deposit is a perfect example. You can look at that site now, and you will never, ever, ever know that there was ever a mine there. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Rebecca, do you have something to add? Yeah, look, uh, it's it's uh, and again, I recognize that, you know, that we have to be careful uh, commenting on this. Uh, look, we know that they're there and they are known uh, thick deposits and they're large. And and I can't reiterate that sulfides uh, that are higher, you know, um, massive uh, ore deposits, they're harder to find. We know that. Uh, and so, you know, knowing what you've got there is, is definitely a bonus. Yes, they absolutely, you will need to move very, very a large, you have to mine huge amounts at that low grade to actually recover. And you're also going to have to very carefully watch your nickel deportment in these cases. If it's arrowite only, it's a bit easier when you start getting to these mixed systems of sulfides uh, and, uh, and alloys. Uh, we've got some of the smart people out there. We know that they're there. Uh, but, you know, when you're talking about these projects, they, go, they still have quite a big capex attached to them. And it's going to take quite a long time to pay these off. But, you know, they are in, um, we know where they are. They're in good jurisdictions. A number of them also have access to hydroelectricity. So they will end up in many ways being quite a low CO2 footprint. So, you know, there's some positives and some negatives there. And, you know, knowing that you have it is, uh, is an advantage that we already have those deposits there. I think that's a great a great way to end. And I'd like to say that I know we, we tried our best to get through all your questions. There were some great ones in the chat. Maybe both our remaining panelists can um, give contact info or ways to get a hold of them, hit them up on LinkedIn or something if you if you want to continue talking about this. Yeah. A plug for a few upcoming events. Oh, Mike, did you have something? Well, I was going to say, I, I, I put mine on my my address on my presentation. You can just Google me at Laurentian. Happy to answer questions anytime. Oh, perfect. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. And uh, a number of available on LinkedIn. Okay, great. So a uh, cu couple upcoming SEG events. The end of the year SEG Lecture Symposium will feature the Society's 2023 prominent traveling lectures and the Singlish Lecture, each providing a 50-minute keynote. There's also Lithium Webinar, the fourth installment of this Space Metal webinar series that's in January. Great for students in early careers interested in talking more about that commodity. I know it's a hot topic these days. And on orogenic gold, this two day course will focus on the geology of an exploration for orogenic gold deposits. All right, and I think the presenters there are Rich Goldfarb, Glenn, and uh, Caitlin Jones, and Bob Foster. That's going to be a great one. We are also incredibly excited to announce that SEG 2024 conference will be held in Namibia in late September next year. Teams are being finalized and will be announced shortly, but they will focus on a number of relevant issues related to African exploration and metallogeny, both a regional and global context. It's a great opportunity for students. I've been to all the SEG conferences I can get to, uh, early careers and seasoned professionals to come and really immerse themselves in the uh, truly ge geologically unique and culturally vibrant part of the world. And there are currently planning, we are currently planning to offer seven day field trips throughout the region. So definitely look for those when they're posted. And this is a reminder that as you're exiting, please take our survey and thanks again to our sponsors and our sponsor MapTech and our panelists. 
Simon, Rebecca, and Mike. Thanks, everyone.